Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining BrainMap today. This BrainMap seminar series is co-sponsored by the B41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping, housed in the Martina Center. It is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Sonia Kotz. Dr. Kotz is a translational cognitive neuroscientist investigating prediction and control in action and perception across the lifespan, clinical populations, and animal models. She holds a chair in neuropsychology and translational cognitive neuroscience at the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience at Maastricht University. Today, she will talk about cerebellar circuitry and the timing of sensory motor behavior. Dr. Kotz, the virtual stage is all yours. Thank you, Jara. Uh, and thanks for having me today. <clears throat> so what I would like to uh, do today is to entertain the contribution of cerebellar circuitry um, on sensory um, and sensory motor behavior. Um, and um, in the realm of, of this idea, <clears throat> I asked some uh, basic core questions. And um, one of them is, uh, how do we produce, perceive and integrate dynamic multimodal events? And why we need predictions to actually uh, do this in a meaningful and efficient way. Now, uh, we're all familiar with the current uh, models on predictive coding. Um, and if we look uh, close, more closely at the literature, we see that a lot of the explanation that we find there is very much cortically driven. That means we have top-down regulation of sensory areas. Uh, but I'd like to uh, go back to an older idea, um, and that is the role of the cerebellum in uh, sensory feedback. Um, it's established as the forward model, and I will briefly touch uh, base on that in, in a little while. And um, my, my basic concern is um, if we do have these models available for us uh, to, to make our information processing efficient, um, why not really look at the brain and understand where it could happen? So the question is, does it have to happen just cortically or do the subcortical structures like the cerebellum and the basic ganglia, for example, play a role in this? Um, now, um, uh, let me just bring this up here. This is um, um, a classical conceptualization of the forward model where on the left-hand panel, uh, marked as A, you see the theoretical model and the storyline is pretty simple. Uh, it comes from a motor control. And if there's a, a motor command elicited, uh, we're not just um, activating the motor system and the musculoskeletal system. But supposedly there is what we call an efference copy, um, and this is uh, going uh, ultimately into um, a comparison mode. And the question where this comparison mode uh, takes place is related to the cerebellum. Now, when I talk about a comparison mode, um, it means that we need to understand what the consequences of an action are. They, there are sensory consequences to an action. And of course, um, this type of feedback, this type of sensory feedback uh, can be confirming that an action was correctly executed or that there has been something unexpected. And this comparison between what is predicted or expected uh, compared to what is actually given as input uh, is then generating either a confirmatory signal or an error signal. Um, so if we move to the middle panel where we see the um, anatomical realization in this schematic, we see that indeed um, this seems to be going through the cerebellum. <clears throat> and uh, the, the big question that we address here is, um, is the expected and actual input actually um, compared in the cerebellum or does the cerebellum do something about error signaling back to the cortex in order to lead to adaptations if necessary. Now, what is interesting about this model is that it seems to have a, a brain implementation on the one hand. And um, a few years ago, a colleague, um, Nantanda Ramnani in, in, in the UK, actually proposed that this type of um, 
model for motor control may actually be generalizable to cognitive control or even perceptual control. And that is what you see on the right hand panel. So the idea is pretty much that it's not just um, a motor uh, command that uh, leads to a form of an evidence copy, but maybe also um, other functions, including sensations uh, from multiple modalities. So um, the research that I will present to you today will explore exactly that option. Um, is there a chance that based on this neurofunctional model, um, we have an option to see whether um, this model generalizes um, across modalities? Um, so um, the, the type of work that I will present today uh, relates on the one hand to very classical event-related brain potentials. Um, and here we have what we call indices of prediction and prediction errors. Uh, we find those in very early uh, event-related brain potentials called the P50 and the N1. Um, and in the auditory modality, um, this um, suppression effect that I will be explaining in a second um, is source localized in the secondary auditory cortex. Now, where do we find these types of uh, responses if we source localize or use MEG um, and fMRI? Uh, we find that when events are self-generated, so for example, you press a button and you elicit a sound, um, this um, self-induced action and its sensory consequences will lead to a suppression of the N100 component. We also see a suppression effect when we look at multi-sensory events. So now we're looking at two sensory modalities where one may be predicting another. And if the prediction is uh, occurring successfully, then there's also suppression effect. We also find it interestingly enough in the unisensory uh, modality. So whether that's auditory or visual, um, when um, an event is sensorily temporally predictable. So here we have now the temporal dimension that may be playing a role when we look into unisensory events. Um, now, you also find something happening uh, before the target uh, onsets. So if we look at this example up here, we see uh, the amplitude uh, display um, as the onset of a target. And then you have this classical um, uh, response that is suppressed relative to an external sound. And that is what, when we talk about an N1 suppression effect. But stuff is also happening before. So when, I, when we're going now away to the left from the zero onset point. And what is quite striking in the literature at the moment is that uh, we talk about alpha slash beta suppression. Sometimes it's a bit uh, tricky in terms of where the frequency band starts um, or leaves uh, a particular frequency range. Um, we see that there's also a form of a suppression in these two frequency ranges uh, when we have a stimulus um, almost imminently occurring. So it seems to be related to some form of temporal prediction. So I think if we really realistically want to think about uh, uh, this, this concept of suppression and prediction, then uh, I would argue that when we look pre-stimulus um, onset, we're looking into the prediction formation. And when we look at the target and one suppression effect, uh, we look at the outcome of what is predicted and the comparison thereof, namely, is there an error or not? Um, and so the big question that I want to address with this work or have addressed with this work is now, um, do we see any evidence that the cerebellum is involved in this comparison process? Or do we have to check off this forward model idea in favor of a cortical cortical loop uh, that has been described in predictive coding? So I'm just throwing up a, a, a schematic here of what we're going to look at next. Um, um, so we're going to look into uh, a link between the sensory cortices and the motor cortis, cortex and how the cerebellum may actually uh, up and down regulate the sensory cortex uh, when we start with uh, an action. So um, 
the way we have started this work initially um, quite a while ago is that we uh, tested patients who had lesions in the cerebellum. Now, if you look at this, this is a, class, a classic lesion overlay map. Uh, you may say right away, wow, this is lesions all over the place. How can you possibly draw any conclusions from that? Well, the story is maybe simple, maybe not. But the idea is if indeed um, any modality that is uh, processed in, in the cerebellum um, follows this principle of comparing input and output and, and uh, developing an error signal of sorts, then um, it should not really matter where in the cere cerebellum this happens because it's a generalizable type of mechanism. So um, this was a dare, but let's see what happens with it. And as I said, uh, we're gonna look at this suppression effect in these patients compared to healthy controls. So the way we started this work is to work with what we call an N1 suppression paradigm, where we have um, an auditory motor condition that is press a button and you elicit a sound. Um, the timing of how the sound is elicited is then uh, presented as the physical sound uh, in the auditory only condition. So we have temporal alignment of the occurrence of these sounds. Um, and they're equivalent sounds, so they're exactly the same. And we have what we call a motor control condition, and we use that uh, control condition to subtract uh, motor activity uh, from the auditory motor condition so that we more or less in, an, in a clean way can look at uh, the suppression effect. So what happens uh, when we do that? Um, we um, ultimately see here um, an exemplar electrode from the electrode set we, that we measured from. And in blue, you see the auditory only response and in red, the auditory motor corrected response. And what we see very nicely and as expected is a suppression effect when you self-induce a sound. Okay, so um, the big question is now, what role does the cerebellum play here? And do the cerebellar patients actually show this differentiation between an external sound source and the sound that is self-induced? And uh, it was uh, actually quite stunning to us uh, when we looked at this first experiment to see that the patients actually did not differentiate uh, meaningfully between the external sound and the self-induced sound um, in the range of the N100. Now, um, you may not notice this, but from the paradigm as it is set up, we used uh, more or less um, um, little blocks of these different conditions. And one question that of course arose is, is that in any way driving attention to a particular stimulus dimension? So we should actually try to test that in a more event-related design, namely mixing the conditions relative to blocking the conditions to see whether this was specific. And this is what we ended up doing. Um, and um, what you see now is on the left-hand panel, um, the, the single presentation. So that would be the presentation that was blocked compared to the mixed condition. And again, in the healthy controls, we see very clearly this N1 suppression effect that even seems to be slightly larger in the mixed condition. Um, when we now look at the cerebellar patients, we see, again, no difference between the externally induced uh, sound and the self-induced sound. So in a sense, we're replicating the results. Um, and uh, we also show that it's not dependent on attention to a particular stimulus dimension. Um, <clears throat> so we're, of course, interested to see whether this can also uh, be transferred to um, higher level uh, uh, production. And in, in that particular experiment that I present here, we use the very same paradigm, but instead of having people press a button and listen to a sound, we actually pre-recorded their voices 
and with a button press, we presented their voice. Now you could say this is slightly artificial and they, that in itself may lead to a change in suppression because it's artificial, uh, but people were trained to do this beforehand and they did not perceive their own voice as odd when they actually induced it via button press. And so if we look at uh, this suppression effect again for self-induced yeah, voice production, we see again a nice suppression effect. Now, what we ended up doing here in order to challenge the system then was to actually change the sensory feedback uh, uh, to the own voice by changing the pitch of the voice. And this is what you're looking at on the right hand panel B. Um, so what we actually see is as a function of an increased error response, uh, the suppression effect, so the difference between the blue and the red line minimizes. So uh, we're changing um, as a function of an error signal. So um, what I said before, um, that the N100 could be a marker that gives us insight uh, as to whether um, sensory feedback has been successful or whether an error was um, uh, induced um, is actually quite a sensitive measure for that. Now that has implications for our work in um, healthy voice hearers and ultimately also uh, thinking about risk factors uh, for psychosis. And <clears throat> what I want to share with you here is um, a first data set that we collected results on. Again, it's the same paradigm, so I don't have to repeat that. Um, but here we're testing healthy participants that on a um, um, spectrum of, of proneness for voice hearing um, are either low on uh, voice hearing or higher on voice hearing. We use a scale called the Lonnie Slate Hallucination Scale that has been developed um, to <clears throat> test healthy participants who experience uh, voice hearing. And what we did here is, um, on the one hand, again, uh, use the tone button press paradigm, and at the same time, we tested them in the self-voice uh, paradigm. And what you see very nicely here at the top is uh, the panel A and panel B for tones left and self-voice uh, on the right. Um, a nice suppression effect in those participants who are actually scoring zero on auditory verbal hallucinations or hallucinations in general. Now, when we look uh, in the middle panel for participants who are actually high, high uh, prone to experience hallucinations, and we look at the tones, we see a relatively comparable effect to the um, uh, low proneness participants. But interestingly enough, when we look at the self-voice production, we see a reversal of the effect. So it seems these participants are giving more attention to their own voice uh, rather than suppressing it. Um, so this we thought was an interesting result because this is a healthy population. And uh, so we're pursuing this currently uh, in a number of directions, including resting state and modeling. Now, if we look at first incident psychosis uh, participants, um, we see that um, the suppression effect goes down already for the tones, and it does go down uh, for the self-voice, even though you may say it looks quite comparable to the low uh, uh, hallucinators, but as a matter of fact, the overall effect is, is uh, much smaller and actually non-significant. And on top of it, you may denote that the amplitude modulation of the N1 is massively re reduced in the psychotic patients. So um, if I want to summarize this, um, I, I think what we can um, show with these data is that the cerebellum seems to be indeed involved in the modulation of the auditory N1 suppression effect. This seems to be happening independent of the allocation of attention to the dimension selectively 
And um, what I didn't talk about, we tried to also manipulate the timing of the external sound uh, to see whether people perceive an external sound as self-induced, the closer it gets to a self-induced sound, uh, but that is not the case. <clears throat> we also see that um, we find an N1 suppression that um, really works for voice production, and that allows us to a certain extent to control for motor artifacts that have been um, discussed in, in active voice production. And we think this is a, a good measure forward for um, implications in psychiatric disorders with transdiagnostic symptoms such as ABH. And if you're interested, we put forward uh, a model idea here in, in, this, in this publication just recently. <clears throat> now, I, I think uh, we can talk about this um, as functional evidence, but ultimately we need to also get to a point where we show that we have a structural foundation of, of such an idea or concept. Um, so again, we used uh, a patient cohort to investigate whether we actually find direct uh, structural connectivity between the cerebellum thalamus and sensory cortices, in this case, the temporal cortex. Um, so what we did here, and I will uh, put this up right away, is to work uh, again with patients. Um, and these were patients who had lesions in the posterior superior temporal sulcus of the left hemisphere. Um, Heschel's gyrus was spared. And uh, what we know um, about um, these patients is that they have temporal processing deficits. Um, and we were interested in, in a first clinical approach to find out whether they're particularly um, sensitive to uh, short time scale transitions. Um, and we started that from uh, timing thresholds and order, ordering and micro patterning, going then to phoneme discrimination <clears throat> and then up to the word level, looking into pseudo word and word discrimination. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and what you see here uh, is only relevant to understand how we actually got to the lesion symptom mapping. Um, so if patients had scored higher than zero, and uh, more than two standard deviations away from the mean of the controls. And they, here you see the numbers of the patients. Uh, then these grouped across the board of all the tests that we did as patients who had temporal discrimination deficits across these dimensions. Uh, we then um, did a lesion overlap based on the symptoms and isolated uh, via voxel-based statistics, an area in the brain, in the left temporal, uh, superior temporal sulcus, um, that is sort of a core area where these deficits cluster. We then used this seed region and tracked uh, via probabilistic trichography in healthy HMAT controls, um, the, the fiber tracking uh, that, that can happen from this particular seed region. And um, it's not very surprising to see that you have the dorsolateral uh, fiber pathways uh, going from this seed region to the frontal cortex by the arcuate fasciculus. We also have um, fiber bundles uh, passing the uh, extreme capsular system, sparing out the basal ganglia system. But what was most important to us was ultimately to find potential connectivity between uh, this seed region in the left uh, temporal uh, cortex, posterior temporal cortex, uh, to the cerebellum. And um, this is rather tricky because you have some really, really tight uh, funneling uh, in the pontine region. And uh, what we were able to, to do is demonstrated here is that from this seed region in the temporal cortex, we were actually able to track into the cerebellum and could differentiate that 
from uh, direct frontopontine uh, M1 fiber connections to the motor cortex. So this is a rather critical result for us uh, that we can actually really separate what would be motor driven versus non-motor driven. Mm. So uh, based on these data, I think at least we have some first evidence that there is indeed connectivity between uh, the cerebellum and this critical seed region in the temporal cortex um, that may relate to these um, auditory responses that we have seen in the EG. But of course, complementary to that, we have the cerebellar lesion data. So we think that uh, we have some evidence that allows us to argue that the extraction and representation of temporal structure for simple and complex auditory signals um, in production and perception um, seem to actually engage the cerebellum. All right. So. Um, that is not the end of the story because ultimately for me, the hardcore test would have been to say, okay, if this works from motor sensory uh, binding, um, does it also work for sensory sensory binding? So multi-sensory modality and integration. And this is what I'm going to address in the next few slides. Um, so, in the first case, we went back to our cerebellar uh, population and we thought long and hard about how we could implement that in, in a decently comparable way to what the uh, motor sensory paradigm was. And we came up with the following idea. Uh, we used uh, what we call a fixed temporal uh, condition where um, uh, a flashing um, sign uh, was bound to an auditory tone in a temporally predictable manner. So this was always the same SOA, but we also had um, a random uh, binding condition where um, the binding could either be of a shorter uh, time window, a longer time window, or there was no binding at all. So if the hypothesis holds true, uh, we should for the temporally predictable um, condition find a similar type of suppression effect uh, that we found uh, for the uh, motor auditory condition. And if that pans out, then, and the, the predictability is the driving factor here, then our cerebellar patients, again, should not show um, uh, a response to this predictability. So let me show you the results of the healthy controls. And what you see here is now um, in blue, the unpredictable temporal condition versus the predictable uh, temporal condition. And we do indeed see a suppression effect in the healthy controls. Um, it's, it's very clear that the suppression effect is much smaller than when uh, motor activity is involved, but the suppression effect is here. Uh, what was most striking to us, however, was indeed that the cerebellar patients again did not show a suppression effect. That is no differentiation between temporally predictable and temporally unpredictable binding of auditory and visual modalities. So I think this is nice and complementary. But of course, we want to also see this in some other conditions. So what I'm going to show you now is a different line of research where we work with uh, multisensory stimulation, dynamic multisensory stimulation. So we have an auditory only condition, a visual condition, and uh, of course, an audiovisual condition. And uh, what we ultimately should expect is when we compare the audiovisual against the auditory condition, that we see a suppression effect for the audiovisual condition, uh, as just discussed. Um, we did, uh, on the one hand, um, fMRI work on this. And what I'm showing you here is the result of a conjunction analysis where we compared the audiovisual against visual and audiovisual against auditory. And um, quite, um, yeah, we were quite excited about this because what we ultimately see is indeed bilateral activation of the cerebellum. 
uh, the bilateral superior temporal gyrus, and we find, as expected, the bilateral uh, mediate geniculate body activated uh, in the thalamus. So there seems to be some reality to this um, kind of um, idea, model idea, also based on more complex types of multisensory speech stimuli. Um, this also showed ultimately in an EEG experiment, and I would just like to focus you on the difference again between the blue and the red line. In green, you see the visual information uh, sort of moseying along, uh, but obviously that comes prior uh, to the onset of the auditory uh, stimulus, and you see a nice suppression effect here. When we now look um, into the pre-stimulus uh, baseline and we look um, at heat maps here for auditory, uh, visual and audiovisual, we see indeed an alpha suppression effect that is comparable between the visual and audiovisual stimulation, uh, but not for the auditory uh, information. Of course, we also see some uh, emotion specific effects because I, sorry, I, I kept this away from you. Uh, in this particular uh, paradigm, we also tested um, um, this integration of audiovisual information that was neutral, fearful, or angry. And we see a very nice suppression effect here, but this is not really what I want to focus on today. So, um, I'm more or less coming to the end of my presentation. Um, and um, I hope I have been able to show you today that the idea of an internal model uh, can generalize uh, and it doesn't just apply to um, the motor modality, but it obviously also is applicable to other forms of binding conditions, including multisensory. Uh, conditions. Um, so I think um, this is uh, an interesting result, and we're clearly uh, pursuing this further at the moment. Um, the idea behind this for us is at the moment that re-entry systems such as the cerebellar loops may indeed contribute to successfully predicted sensory feedback and errors thereof, um, sending error signals back to the respective uh, uh, cortical areas um, that are involved in the induction of, of, of the sensation. Um, so um, I think um, what I haven't extensively talked about today, but that may become indirectly apparent is that um, the cerebellum is sensitive not only to this error signaling and feedback, giving feedback to the cortex, but it also seems to be involved in slower and faster dynamics. So temporal time scale sensitivities um, um, that uh, are interestingly enough lateralized with faster transitions in the right cerebellum and slower transitions in the left cerebellum. And one of, I, one of the ideas that one could think about is how that actually feeds into ideas of asymmetric sampling in the temporal cortex. Um, it clearly plays a role in uh, how we process information in time and uh, that this is clearly obviously also something that we utilize when we produce and perceive speech, uh, but this could be any other more complex uh, dynamic signal. Um, yeah, uh, this brings me to my thanks, the funders as usual, uh, and all the great students that have been in the lab and still are in the lab. Uh, Annika, who did the work on uh, DT, the DTI work, Sarah, the fMRI work on multisensation, Francisca on the um, cerebellar patients, and so Michael, and Ana Pinero, um, a colleague in Portugal, uh, uh, who I work with on the healthy and uh, clinical voice hearers. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm open to discussion of questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for your talk. Um, so yeah, while well, people um, type their questions or um, raise their hand, um, I can start with, um, with some questions. 
So, oh, we actually already have one, but I'll ask my question anyway. So, uh, um, I know you work in translation neuroscience too. So, uh, I was curious to know whether you had looked into um, this temporal um, cerebellar connections in um, animals, perhaps, or with other means than tractography. Yeah, we, we're currently not so much focusing on the cerebellum in the animal work, but we're focusing on the thalamus um, because um, given what I just said in terms of um, multiple modalities and binding of multiple modalities, I think the thalamus as a, as a transfer station to the cortex is actually um, an interesting target. And uh, so we have done the um, unisensory timing work in the thalamus uh, in the rat model, and we find uh, pretty nice and confirmatory evidence there um, that uh, suppression is already starting to be regulated in the thalamus. Um, uh, we're about to start uh, our first deep brain stimulation in the thalamus of uh, tinnitus patients uh, on the 7th of July, so I'm super excited about that. Um, so we should have relatively soon very complementary data along these lines. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Odin. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, Sonia, how are you? Hi, hi Odette, how are you? <laughs> yeah, wonderful talk as usual. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, I wanted it. to ask you uh, about your blog diagram. Uh, there was a box there on basal ganglia that you yes. shadowed. <laughs> Can you say something about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, we also uh, looked into patients who have lesions in the basal ganglia, and I also look into Parkinson patients. And uh, the long and the short of it is it's quite interesting because the results seem to be complementary. And that is um, the basal ganglia patients do show a suppression effect. Uh, but when you look later in the signal, uh, so in the N2 range, uh, with increasing error signals, their N2 is affected. So it seems like the suppression effect is something that we could argue is more automatically regulated. You know, we, we respond to it pretty fast and efficiently. While when things take more effort and, and so forth, then... Um, the, the more controlled basal ganglia system comes into play, which of course is also an error signaling system, um, but it seems to be more under attentional control. So I think we're looking a little bit at a yin and a yang here um, of, of balancing whether the monitoring is done fast, efficient, without awareness and uh, more effortful and with attention uh, on the other hand. Thank you. All right, uh, we have another question from Jonathan. Uh, hi, so I'm, I'm familiar with uh, your work looking at a dual pathway model um, in which uh, event-based audit auditory information is rapidly transmitted by the cerebellum. Uh, right. And I've, I've been trying to, I've been struggling with the relationship between these two pictures of the cerebellum. Of course, it can do many different things, but is there are these separate or are you look at these as interrelated functions? Um, you mean between within the cerebellum, uh, the suppression effect and the timing or where, where are you going with this, Jonathan? I, I guess I'm, I'm asking whether uh, you think that the cerebellum's role in transmitting event-based auditory information is, um, I, I mean, wh whether there's a, a, a conceptual framework for understanding that as in the, in the same context as its its forward model. So uh, is it, um, for instance, when uh, it's suppressing auditory uh, input, is that uh, part of its action along the same auditory pathway? Uh, as, right, as right, get it, yes, okay. As a matter of fact, yes, because we have um, done work on that, in, again, in the cerebellar patients where we worked with these, time scale sensitivities in just in audition. And we see similar kinds of um, problems uh, with temporally predictable auditory sounds 
uh, in these patients. Um, and again, we see also problems when we have these patients undergo what we call um, sort of um, a synchronization adaptation continuation task. Um, so um, they, they have problems not just with the predictability of the stimulus uh, and, and which should in, in consequence lead to a suppression effect, uh, but it's also very much driven by the timing of the stimulus. So, um, and this goes back to what I said at the end, you know, these, these very fast transitions um, and the time scale sensitivity that we find in the left and the right cerebellum play a crucial role there. So yes, I, your, my answer to you would be yes. This can go along. Thank you. All right. Oh, we do have another question. Um, I think I'll just read it out. Um, so the first question is, does the different line shape per condition mean anything? Um, so um, are you talking about the ERP tracings? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe you want to ask yeah. your question, um, Jung? Young Kim, can you please unmute? Yeah, ask. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello, Kim. Hi. <laughs> I just want to make sure I understand your question correctly. Oh, I see. Just yeah. curious, like, you know, the, the line width or uh, the, you know, I see the, the record. I'm just, I don't know the exact condition, but then the, the red line and blue line, they, they look different to me in, in terms of shapes and uh, te uh, temporal uh, signatures. As, as a function of, of the different experiments or within, within uh, one line? Line shape, just a physical shape. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, um, I mean, what, what we want to take home here is the, the difference between um, the conditions. And, and if I, let me just pull this up again. Um, can, you, can you see this? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, um, so if we, and you can see my cursor as well? Yep. Okay. So, um, so this is um, uh, an evoked potential that modulates more negatively than the one with the red line, right? So this is, this is what we're looking at at the moment. And so, of course, the width uh, can be sometimes a bit broader um, and uh, the amplitude can be globally a bit larger. Um, the width often has to do with the fact that people may have different latency and how they respond. So it may be just shifting things a little bit to the left or the right. And that means um, that the peak um, that you see here uh, may then shift a little bit along the time axis here. Okay. Um, but um, we don't want to overinterpret um, um, the height uh, or the amplitude rise of something. Um, now, if if I move on to um, something like that, so you may say, okay, this looks different, right? The the overall amplitude size is smaller, and maybe um, the the line tracing also looks a bit broader. Uh, this may have to do with the stimulus complexity. So the, the more complex the stimulus becomes, the more variability you get into your signal. Um, just a simple ratio over the positive and negative. Uh, you see, it looked to me, uh, it, uh, it varies quite a bit per condition. So uh, does it mean anything? <laughs> um, are, are we looking at this here? Oh, even the previous uh, slide. Uh, I think I, I don't really quite understand where you want oh, to go. A, oh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm there, <laughs> no, 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 no. But I want to answer your question. So, um, I mean, what, what yeah, for example, also... for example, the, the bottom uh, uh, line shape is the yeah. red line has a very positive, good positive peak. Yeah, but this was, this was the result that I was talking about. Yes, so yes. The, the, the prediction was that these patients who have lesions in the cerebellum uh, will not show this classical suppression effect. Yes. 
And that means if they, if they cannot separate between um, an external sound source and a sound that they self-induce, then the difference between the two condition becomes smaller. And that is exactly what we see in these patients. So for us, this is at least indirect evidence that the cerebellum contributes to the suppression effect that you see That's in right. the health okay. so that, that I understood, but then the following, yeah. The, the negative sh uh, down uh, on the shoot. Oh, uh, you mean the following? Yeah, yeah. That's oh, that's, that's a that's a second component that I didn't really talk about. So right. uh, I, this, I, I was, uh, is, this is the P two hundred, and yeah, we can probably talk for for ages about that response. Um, but it <laughs> yeah. goes a little uh, it goes a little bit along with what I said before. So this this early suppression uh, response seems to happen. I wouldn't say it happens automatically, but it ha happens very fast and and efficient. While the, the longer you go into the EEG signal, the more it becomes attention driven. So we think right. sort of this basic categorization, whether something is a sound or not, uh, may actually not be affected in these patients. So this dissociation is actually quite interesting. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, All right. The second question is, uh, yeah, do you see any time, time or uh, temporal uh, difference between these? Uh... Uh, in the in the response in the yes, response in the, in the EEG Look, no yeah, yeah. temporally there is no difference um, so no we 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 also looked of course at behavior and response times and uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the response times the patients were more variable than the the healthy controls and they were uh, clearly also um, yeah they made more errors. But in the EEG, we control for errors. So we only use the signals that were sort of responded to correctly. But can I uh, interpret it as like, there's no conduction speed difference? Um, there is or there isn't, sorry, this is- There, there is not, there's no-, no, no not, not, not at the signal level. Um, that doesn't mean that ultimately in the reaction times, you don't see differences. Okay. Thank you but much. this is much later than this early brain response, right? So we, we always have to see yeah. that relative to each other. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions. Okay. So I think I want to thank you again for the nice talk. And I want to thank you everyone okay. for attending Brain Map and for the nice discussion. And All right. we will see you here in person. Yeah, that would be lovely. At some point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll make sure I let you know before I come. <laughs> sounds good. All right. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay, Thanks, everyone, everyone, for your interest. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, take care. Bye.